I'm Tom Addington here on behalf of 8th and Walton here one on one today with Cameron Smith. Welcome Cameron. Thank you. Cameron is officially the founder and chief executive of Cameron Smith and Associates which is an executive recruiting firm here in Northwest Arkansas focused on the supplier community. That's his kind of his official title. Unofficially though he really is the as far as I'm concerned the person who the, the single individual who has his pulse on the heart of what the supplier community needs in terms of personnel to be successful, he helps build supplier teams. And so we're here to talk to him today about how that's done and what it looks like and what a supplier team needs to look like in order to be successful. We really appreciate your taking time, Cameron. My pleasure. I think it might be really worthwhile to step back first and kind of rewind uh, the tape and find out how you even got here. How does one get to be um, in the center of the plate, essentially, of supplying the, the supplier community with, with personnel? Well, it's a long story. I'll try to make it brief. Um, after 10 years in the corporate world with Champion Spark Plug Company and Gulf and Western Industries out of Los Angeles, I entered the world of executive search. I had an opportunity to join company called Career Consultants, a very elite firm out there. And uh, this was back in the, boy, early 80s. And five years into that business, um, you know, I felt that I was quite successful and I branched off my own. I opened up a firm called the Cameron Agency. Mm -hmm. And that was based out of Orange County, California, doing pretty much regional type placements out there for the consumer product industry. Um, it was... Um, uh, I was on vacation in Las Vegas and I happened to meet the woman of my dreams who happened to live in Arkansas and after a two year long term relationship it, we had to decide who's going to move where well I lost the coin flip and Arkansas I went and surfboard and all and this is about 1992 I felt that I could transfer my executive search business to Arkansas and I probably was a bit aggressive with that. It wasn't as easy as I thought, but I started getting some some work with Entergy back here, which is a large energy company. And I just happened to stumble on an opening for Huffy Bicycle Company calling on Walmart. And I knew that I lived somewhere close proximity to Walmart headquarters, but I'd never seen it or been up there. And at the time I was about 50 miles just south of there in Fort Smith. Well, I took the recruiting assignment, and during the recruiting process, I stumbled on a cluster of companies that were in and around the Walmart uh, vicinity. So I made some appointments, drove up the hill, and not only were there a small cluster of companies, they were clustered in one or two office parks and basically wrapped up in a neat little package for me with signs out there with Clorox and Pillsbury and Nestle. and I thought I died and went to heaven. I'd never seen anything like that. So I had my meetings. I sort of org charted who was up there, and I, I came away with a number of about 48 suppliers, which I thought was just unbelievable. Went back to Fort Smith, and I'd made a decision right then. I was going to slant my business to this Walmart supplier yeah. market. I researched who was manning those teams and I reached out to them. Mm -hmm. And I would say about half of them called me back, which gave me enough recruiting assignments to start going. And pretty soon I was working by myself and right then my associates were a yellow pad in the phone back in 1993. I got so busy that, you know, they say in business school that once you get to that level, duplicate your efforts. So I hired another recruiter and then I hired another recruiter just to keep up with the pace so of the work. So how many do you have right now? We have uh, 21 now recruiters. Yeah, okay. that work nationally. Yeah. So, the the Walmart so as the Walmart supplier world grew and more companies uh, realized they should be here close to their largest customer, we grew, and we really had no real competition back then. Let's talk about that Walmart supplier world just a little bit. I mean, you came in '92 or so, and that was at the very beginning of what would become a flood of suppliers into Northwest Arkansas against the Walmart business. Correct. And if P&G was the first, 
then there were, you know, when you got here there were 48. Like you said, at that time, 48 seemed like a large number. Now there are how many? 1,232 to my knowledge. 1,232 right. suppliers here, all of them specifically focused on serving Walmart yeah. um, as in, in their business. Um, the, the, the area, you know, you, you, you refer to, to the office park, probably was Boterre, Boterre at office that park. time. And now, of course, um, there are multiple of those parks, you know, all over Northwest Arkansas. And Northwest Arkansas kind of has a, uh, a, a, a title of Venderville. Correct. You know, even though now we're not called, uh, they aren't called vendors, they're called suppliers, it, that name has stuck. How has, um, why have so many suppliers established a presence in Venderville over the last 15 plus years? Why have they done it? Well, there's a variety of reasons, but uh, mainly face time with your buyer. If I had to pick one nugget, you would have, you have more access to your buyer, more face time with your buyer. You're able to react to uh, new strategies and new Anything that's new with Walmart, you're there and able to act, react quickly. Um, also, it's not supposed to be about relationships. Walmart has always frowned on that, but it's about relationships. I mean, when you're into the community, you're going to go to church with the buyers and your kids are going to go to school with their kids, and you become friendly, not to the point where you're doing things on weekends, but it really works and it is about relationships because I've seen it over and over and over. So there's a variety of reasons but really um, relationships, face time with your buyer and speed. And let me, let, let, let me ask you this about that just out of curiosity. Those, you know, the speed issue and the face time with the buyer issue has, is there more reason to be here now than there was 15 years ago or less reason? In other words, you know, do I need, you know, essentially to, to run the business, to run my part of a business well inside of a Walmart store and in the Walmart community of stores in the Walmart community of countries, you know, mm -hmm. they've got, uh, we're in 15 or so plus countries. Um, do, do I, is it more important now or less important now than it was before to have that access or to have that presence? Presence is really the right As word. of right now, today, it's never been more important because Walmart is shifting his whole merchandising program and the people that are not here are just reading it off memos. The people that are here are living it. Um, there's a big shift in the merchandising area where the buyer is no longer the CEO of the category. You are not dealing with one single point of contact. There are buying teams now, and those buying teams consist of finance, category management, and replenishment. So more than ever, you should have a presence here to be able to get to these people. What's, what's kind of a cutoff point in terms of how big do you have to be to justify a presence? It really depends on a lot of things. Um, size of your business, dollar volume, how many SKUs, how many products you have, how many categories you're calling on. There are some companies like Shell, for instance, they sell to I believe 17 different categories inside Walmart. So therefore, you've got to have uh, manpower for each one of those categories. But we have 100-person uh, teams and we have one-person teams. I think right now there's close to 400 companies represented by one person here, some of which are just working out of their home, running Retail Link but they also can run over and have that 30 second me meeting with Walmart on a moment's notice. So the one person team essentially would be a local point of contact to speak to the buyer, to be present here, to run we retail link, right. and, then, and then others from the company would come in at key strategic t intersections for, for, uh, for mm -hmm. other kinds of meetings, I would assume that's that's. Well, how they're all work. different. Um, yeah. You know, for the most part, I think the one-person teams are your relationship managers and sometimes the analysts. They'll do both. Mm -hmm. If it's just one or two different products and they've come up through the analysis side and they have have good communication skills and they're a good person that they can put one person here, they can do it all. Sometimes you'll just have a relationship manager 
and the analysis done back at corporate, most of the time it's just on the one person teams I'm saying would be an analyst, somebody that's crunching numbers locally and that can deliver those numbers to the buyer on a moment's notice. And it really, it's a very small investment when you, if you have a company that's coming in here eight times a year, you can hire somebody part time as an analyst working out of their home. You could cut those trips in half and you'd be saving money if it's all about the money and you still have a local presence. Just out, and as the business grows, then you can you can add other personnel. Oh, absolutely. So absolutely. just out of curiosity, you know, give me give us a sense of how difficult it is to, to recruit and or find people to uh, to place on those teams today versus what it was in ninety two when you first started. Well, the biggest reason and the biggest obstacle we come up with is that the job descriptions are changing every day. And the supplier teams are asking for a lot. And if they're not willing to be competitive on the money, then it's almost impossible for, for us to find somebody. Now, they're usually... They're looking at their competitors. How are they structured? Who's, who's looking the, at their competitors? Well, yeah. A supplier. A supplier. Let's yeah. just say uh -huh. it's a confection supplier. Yeah. And they'll look at what the other confection, what the Hershey's doing, what Brock's is doing, what uh, Eminem Mars is doing, and they'll usually put uh, resources against the business that based are commensurate on, with yeah. with what those competitors. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. But I guess uh, one of my one of the things I wonder about is. In uh, 92, in 94, not many people had heard about Northwest Arkansas. No. Not many people had been to Northwest Arkansas. I would think that in those early days of trying to get people to show up here, it'd be a real sell job. You'd have to really, Absolutely. really work at getting a, you know, somebody who's leaving, well, I mean, you came from California, Mr. Yeah. Santa Monica, but I mean. Well, let um, me tell you a story how we, we, we uh, combated that. What we were trying to lure companies here, people don't realize we didn't just place the jobs here, but we actually reached out to companies and brought them here. We would look at the category, for instance, confection, like we were just saying, and we'd see that uh, this company A is here, company B is here, company C is here. Where's company D? Why are they not here? And we would go to them. We would provide testimonial from the suppliers here as to why Bentonville we would tell them how their competition was set up, and then they realized internally they had to have a presence here. The second decision they have to make is, do they relocate somebody from their company out here that knows their product, or do they go to the local talent pool and find somebody that knows Walmart? Eight times out of 10, they opted to, to go to the local pool and the Walmart really? experience weighed out over the industry experience. Yep. Yeah, that surprises me. I would have thought it was the other way around. No, it's uh, the relationship with Walmart. Interesting. So, Cameron, Walmart obviously has, uh, for a long time, been doing international stuff, but there is now a significant international expansion that's going on as they look to those foreign markets. To what extent is important is it is it important or crucial for a supplier team to be located in Bentonville, Arkansas, or around in Northwest Arkansas somewhere, if much of their business with Walmart is out somewhere uh, from uh, the United States? Well, there's really no set format for that. There's a lot of um, uh, of questions up in the air regarding international. Everybody's paying attention to it. Certainly your tier one companies, your Procter and Gamble's and Pepsi's and Coca-Cola's have, have uh, people on the ground in those countries mm -hmm. and they call it in country. A lot of the domestic companies here are really watching to see what Walmart's gonna do next. We keep hearing about them setting up regional buying areas around in different mm -hmm. countries like Chile and uh, in, well, they have a global procurement in China, but in the UK. And once they do decide that, then you will see some mini vendorvilles really? built in those, those places. Yeah, we're just not seeing it yet. Where do you think it'll happen first and second? I think it's gonna be South America, mm -hmm. um, Brazil, Chile, uh, Argentina. 
and in those countries specifically or in a, in be a in place one. where there would be one, it'll be one for that them. region. Right. And oh. we don't know who it is, where it's going to be. Interesting. I wish I did. Yeah. But we would set our office up there now. But uh, everybody's just uh, sitting on go. Yeah. You, you talked about Walmart's uh, merchandising shift to a team approach, right? Mm -hmm. How does that affect it? What, what does that mean, really, to, uh, to a supplier or, or to a supplier team in Northwest Arkansas or wherever they're located? I mean, how does that mean that they, that they have multiple points of contact um, at multiple times, or does it mean you have multiple points of contact, that is, a team meeting at one time? How does that all work? Well, it, it's just starting right now. What we are seeing is the supplier teams are looking for people with tremendous communication skills, master communicators, because now more than ever, they've got to communicate with the buyer, with finance, with replenishment, all in one buying team, and decisions have to be made there. You can't keep going back and forth, so now more than ever, this person that's a relationship manager has to be uh, on their game. Not only that, but they're gonna have to learn how to communicate back to corporate office and get their buy-in. So we are seeing companies really step up their talent, and the war on talent for that is fierce right now. Salaries are going up for those positions, but the, the person that has got the right pl person in place, and these supplier, at least Walmart knows what they've done in the past, it's gonna carry a lot of weight. So, but when, the, when, when a supplier goes and meet with the, meets with this team at right. Walmart, are, is it literally a team, like you're meeting all together in a room, or is it, uh, you know, you're meeting individually with the replenishment individual, the buyer, the whoever else. No, I think we're going to be meeting with the team. You meet, we yeah, meet with the team. Before you oh. met with the buyer, but uh, the way it's I'm a, understanding it's a cross -functional, it, it's a cross-functional team. The cross-functional team has shifted from the supplier to Walmart. Interesting. Very interesting. So what, uh, just out of curiosity, you know, s since you've been here for so long and you've surveyed this landscape for so long, what surprised you most about what's different, what's changed? Well, <laughs> the change, it's uh, one thing that's a constant in this town is Walmart and change. And you, the suppliers that get it and get out in front of that change are the ones that win. If they fight it, um, Walmart's not going to wait around. They're going to leave them behind. But I say the, the biggest surprise for me has been um, the technology side. Um, how fast that is taking hold, uh, the tools to help navigate through Retail Link and Consumer Insights, how fast those companies have developed, got on the ground, and become a very important part for the supplier teams. That's probably my biggest surprise. Does that mean that the suppliers have had to step up their own technology expertise, or are they? Are you just saying there are technology tools that are readily available that they can take advantage of, or do they themselves essentially have to be pretty savvy on the technology side? All of the above. But they do have to um, invest in some of these tools now. There are some tremendous tools out there that for years you, know, you would, your analysts would come in and pull the queries down in Retail Link and it would start with just a, just a plethora of information and they might be ready for a buyer meeting on Wednesday. And if they started pulling this on Monday, now they have tools that can get to that information and they can have a buyer meeting at nine o'clock on Monday. It's, they're tremendous tools. Wow. So it really aids them, but they need to know what they're doing. Absolutely. And, and they have to know their business extremely right. well. Well, but you have to have people on site that can that can run those tools, that yeah. can access those tools. Yeah, the, the, going going back to the Walmart arranging itself in teams, Cameron, mm -hmm. um, does that ha, have you noticed then a corresponding shift in how the teams are, the supplier teams are also arranged? Besides the fact that the communication piece is so crucial on the supplier side, you need somebody who can communicate very very well both 
to the Walmart team as well as back to corporate headquarters. You mentioned that. Right. But what about the actual arrangement of the supplier team itself? Do you notice changes there which correspond to the to the changes on the Walmart side? Yeah, good question. Yes, we are seeing some major shifts. Um, obviously, the job description for the category manager, a category, category advisor, has definitely changed. We are seeing a lot of those category advisors going to work for Walmart now, because basically they were working for Walmart uh, on the supplier team, and now it's shifting back over there. So we're seeing that they are not going to be um, drawing the modulars anymore. They're going to be providing insights. Walmart wants to know everything about their customer and versus your product. So that is real important. What we are seeing also on these cross-functional teams, they used to separate replenishment on a supplier team, category management, sales, sales analysis, mm -hmm. and they'd be siloed off. And now we're seeing some blurring of the lines there and because they have to communicate much more uh, efficiently than they did before. And so that's the biggest shift we're seeing, but that's just starting right now. That's just beginning. So as you see that shift taking place and as you watch these supplier teams, because I know you, you know very, very well how they run on, on a very uh, precise basis, uh, supplier to supplier, what mistakes do you see most often happening? You know, if you, if you were speaking to a whole group of suppliers and they said to you, help us understand what we're doing wrong, you would say, well, the following two, three, two or three things I see consistently as areas where we probably need to get our game up a little bit. Well, there are the um, logical things, um, shipping, you know, order fill, thing fill rate. Those are things that we don't get involved in. Where we're seeing some of the biggest problems is not getting the right people on the bus hiring the wrong people, having the wrong people, not having, not having strong enough people in these positions. They are absolutely crucial. And that's where we see the biggest mistakes. We're seeing hmm. um, people that re in positions, they really aren't qualified to be in those positions. They, were they before? No, they weren't. They weren't before either. So it's not necessarily a matter that the ground has shifted in the the expectations have shifted. They were not necessarily the best people before, and they're not necessarily the best people now. No, a lot of companies are getting that, and they are um, rewiring their talent. Yeah. They're just they're opting to go out and get better talent. Okay, all right. Which, by the way, Cameron, when you say the right people on the bus, you're referring to a book by Jim Collins, the Good to Great book. Exactly. Are there any books like that? Uh, that may be one, but are, any, are there any books like that that you recommend people who are coming this direction toward Bentonville could read that might be helpful uh, for them as they, as they get ready to sort of tackle this whole world here? Any that come to, the, come to your mind? Not really. I, th I think that uh, they're, ask me in five years, uh, they're probably being written right they're now. They're probably being written right now, yeah. What are you, uh, speaking of five years, three to five years down the road, what major challenges do you anticipate a supplier have, uh, will have in the next three to five years as they either initiate or as they grow their Walmart business? Well, it's really, unfortunately, the, what we're seeing right now, personally, I think that Walmart might be pushing a little too hard. And you know, I belong to a lot of think tanks of supplier uh, supplier boards where I've heard them talk amongst each other. And these are some of the largest suppliers on the globe to Walmart. And the ROI just is not there as it was before. And to be honest with you, if Walmart doesn't ease back a little bit, I'm afraid these suppliers are going to start uh, shifting their attention to other customers, especially with the win play show and uh, the SKU optimization we're seeing. We're seeing too much at one time. And I, I agree with a lot of things that Walmart's doing. I applaud them. I think they're brilliant. But I think they're, it's too much too fast right now. That's just my own opinion. So if you were a Walmart supplier, what would keep you awake at night? Is it what you just talked about? Is it something different? Um, yeah, do I have the right people in place? Um, SKU optimization. Because nobody's immune to that. Even 
Procter & Gamble with their great uh, product, Tide, they're being infected, and they've come up with a, a new uh, lower uh, level line of mm -hmm. Tide to fight the private label. Um, so I would say ski optimization, just not knowing what's around the next corner. Cameron, I mean, we were talking about Jim Collins' book, Good to Great. Um, you know, you, I'm sure, could look at these supplier teams, these 1,232 or whatever the number was, and say, okay, um, Tom, uh, that one's not very good at all. That one's good. That one's great. And I'm sure they fit in, in these categories on a continuum. What is the difference if you were to pick out some characteristics between a supplier who you say, this, one, this one's good? They, they're good at what they do, but that one's great. Well, really, um, it comes down to uh, the manpower, the, the quality of the people that are on the team. I mean, this is something we assess every single day. Who's doing what, where, and how well are they doing it? We get testimonial from buyers off the record. We talk to people that have worked on these teams as to who the best is. Um, that's the biggest difference, I think. It's just a person. It's a people. It's a yeah. well. It's a people issue, and it's an education issue. Absolutely. So Absolutely. with 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 what Ethan Walton does in continuing to raise the bar in how the supplier community is educated sure. on specific pieces of working with Walmart, um, that's important at the very beginning. It's important, and it is it important too in a continuing. It is, and way? also I, I I can't leave out the fact that they uh, they're looking for companies that are continuing to innovate and come up with new products, and not just the me too's out there to keep coming up with new things. And if they do, and they they keep trying to better their product product and change the packaging and and evolve with Walmart, they're going to win. But if they fight it, mm -hmm. they're going to lose. It seems as if for a small supplier, especially, knowing how to deploy talent that could be found is tough because there are so many different facets to being successful at Walmart, whether it's replenishment or it's IT and technology or it's the selling piece or what I mean they're just I mean where do you even start so if you're if you're a small supplier and you're thinking about heading this direction or you do have business here and you think you need to uh, be putting together a more, a more robust presence here locally where do you start what do you recommend well we're, we're seeing that I can answer that question truthfully because it's we're seeing small, small suppliers invest in key relationship people. The relationship Walmarts now are built in actual job descriptions we're seeing. We're seeing some former Walmart vice presidents going back into Walmart carrying a bag because they can get an appointment and they, they can really maneuver through Walmart better than somebody that doesn't know their way around the building. But what we're seeing now is, so, and I don't want to make this all about, you know, uh, salaries and money, but we are seeing small companies invest in relationships. We're putting together some of the biggest salary packages every single day, bigger than we've ever seen before. I mean, ridiculous. So seven figure packages, you know, for people that can move the needle, clearly move the needle. And guess what? That's working. For a small supplier, that might just seem a little bit overwhelming. Well, um, case in point, a um, small private label company, they had come in and they had hired uh, a national account manager for me and they had two analysts on the team. That position kept turning over because that person would kept getting recruited away. It was private labels getting bigger and bigger. So finally the president came in and said, you know, what do I have to do here? And I said, well, we can upgrade the talent. And then we, he kept asking me, well, what else do you have? What else do you have? And finally I was saying, well, you have this tier, but there's just no way you can afford that. Well, I challenged him and he thought, what do you mean I can't afford them? And so can you bring, get a couple of those people in here to talk to me? And I thought, oh, how am I gonna do this? These are people that are EVPs managing 70 to 100 person teams. And now I'm gonna tell them to come back and work for a $100 million private label company. 
Well, I introduced him to three or four of them, and he got very excited. He knew he wanted that, and he made an offer unlike anything we've ever seen to someone that it looked like the craziest thing ever. And lo and behold, two years later, that person has tripled the business. So really, you're talking about literally being, well, here, here's, here's, what I, here's what I hear you saying, if, if, if I am hearing you right, okay? If you're here in Bentonville, and you have a good product to sell, and Walmart is a customer interested in that good product you have to sell, by investing in talent right here locally, while it might cost you some money, it provides you tremendous leverage in growing your business. Absolutely. Absolutely disproportionate leverage in growing the business, which might look crazy in another context, but here, the ROI works. Right. If the buying team at Walmart is so-so on the product, and they see this, the right person walk in the door, we know, and they know that, that person is going to manage it, they know that this is going to be managed well, and they're going to have a better shot at it. Yeah, yeah, good. So let, let me, let me uh, ask you, what advice would you have for someone who, who thinks they want to work for a Walmart supplier? Someone, with, com someone comes walking in your door and they say, Cameron, I think I'd like to work for a Walmart supplier. They sit down in front of you and you put your feet up on the desk and you say, well, hmm, here's what I'd suggest. Be careful what you ask for, first of all. I mean, these jobs seem a lot more glamorous than they really are. People hear that they're working for Universal Studios or Disney or Nike and they just have a different vision. They don't realize that they're in their, it's, a, it's all about numbers. And if you're not a numbers person, if you're not an analytical mind, an analytical thinker, this is not for you. Um, also, we tell them that you need to learn how to learn because it is a learning process every single day you're learning. And it's just not as glamorous as everybody think, thinks it is. They just hear these, see these great business cards and that they're living in nice houses work. and driving companies. It's very, very hard work. And, you know, late hours, weekends, your buyer can call you at any time on a Sunday. And uh, if the DC's out of product, product you're going to get a call. I mean, it's not, I'm sure there are some... Uh, companies that uh, that can skate through, but for the most of them, it's a fire drill every single day. Mm -hmm. So, give us some parting advice. Let's say you were you were going to speak to a person who wanted to work as a, a, a you know for a supplier, or let's say you 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 were giving advice to a supplier thinking about coming here or really looking at their business here and trying to figure out how to improve it. Parting words of advice. Okay, well, we'll take the, um, the college student that would like to work in the Walmart vendor community. A junior, a junior position. A junior position. Obviously, there's got to be an entry point at some of This is not a training ground. There are uh, many ways of, of learning and, and going to school. You can go to 8th and Walton, which I think is the number one mm -hmm. uh, educator out there in Retail Link, and they have a couple of courses that you don't actually have to have a retail link ID. Uh, suppliers see that on a resume, then they know that this candidate is serious. Uh, Northwest Arkansas Community College has a market analyst program. It's a bit lengthy, it's I think two or three semesters, but again, it shows commitment. At some point, they're gonna need to do some type of an internship. And they don't have to pay $17 an hour. We we counsel these students all the time. Don't be afraid to take a free internship. You'll work for a, for a supplier. You may be taking out the trash and gassing up the team leader's car, but their currency back to you is going to be teaching you retail link. Mm -hmm. And you invest that time, you're going to get a job in the supplier world, but you're going to have to really want it. Senior leader. What about a senior leader? Advice to a senior, potential senior leader. Advice to a senior leader? Um, Boy, there are so many different things. Um, senior leaders have to figure out where they want to go from here. Oftentimes, they, when they take so long to get to Bentonville, you know, you've 
been all over the company and lived to four or five, six different places, and now you're here in Bentonville managing a team. If you want to go deeper into your company, you're going to have to go back to corporate. Otherwise, you, know, you can write it out here, but they've got to make some decisions early on where they want to go and, and with their career. If they want to get into upper management and more of a decision-making posture, then they're going to have at some point go back to the mothership and, and do a stint there to work your way up the ladder. Otherwise, there you can write out your career here, but those are the biggest decisions that I see for the team leads. Cameron, thank you so much. You are a statesman in this area. Where it's an honor for us to even be able to talk to you well, about thank, this. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to One on One with Cameron Smith at 8th and Walton. We'd love to hear more from you. If you have any questions for us, please feel free to contact us at 8thandwalton.com. That's www.8th, as in the, the number 8, th, and walton.com, or feel free to call us as well. Join us again for a one-on-one -on -one interview.